Who's excited about solving one of the biggest questions in art tonight? We're going to get all the answers. Are you excited? All of them. It's all going to be solved tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you at ANU tonight at the um, invitation of learning communities and ANU alumni to host this debate and tackle a very big topic. It is one that I find myself talking about every other day in this new climate, relatively new climate of speaking up, speaking out and finding out about the public, uh, sorry, the private lives of our public heroes. Can we ever truly separate the art from the artist? And should we? These are the questions we're going to be exploring. On the 18th of March, 2017, Chuck Berry died. The death of this legend, one of the architects of rock and roll, inspired thousands of tributes in the days that followed. Berry's legacy in music is huge. If you don't know, he created the American archetype. It was a style, it was a sound, it was a performance. The Beatles copied him. Keith Richards has said that he pretty much stole every guitar lick that Berry ever played. He was the founding father and created the very attitude of rock and roll. He also spent 18 months in prison in the 1960s after illegally transporting a 14-year-old girl across state lines. In the 90s, Chuck Berry was sued by 52 women for filming them via a secret camera set up in the bathroom of the restaurant that he owned. As the ABC's national music correspondent, I was kind of interested to see that in the obituaries that followed uh, in the days following his death, how various other media outlets and musicians reflected on his life. You know, which parts were kept in and which were left out in remembering this legend. Now more so than ever, we're questioning what we previously let slide in the creative sphere. And an artist's space is often defined by its very lack of boundaries. I mean, there are no rules. That's often what makes it so good and so attractive to us normies. It's what makes artists better than us. You know, they're enigmas who create that magical something out of nothing that the whole world can rally around. The rock star, the auteur, the untouchable. The pedestals that we put creators on often also kind of create that self-imposed distance to us as well. We excuse certain behaviours because we justify that it's what leads to great art. We don't want to disrupt the process. Artists occupy a great, a sacred space and their art actually makes its way into our sacred space. It becomes part of us. To separate the art from the artist is for some to actually protect the art that we love. It's ours. It shapes our identities. It makes sense of our place in the world. Do we lose that if we stand against its creator? And what do we do with the art that's left behind? I remember when I was a little kid being obsessed with Michael Jackson. I've lost count of the amount of times that I've watched Moonwalker. I can pretty much recite it from beginning to end. And the premieres of his video clips on primetime television seemed like a national event to me. Uh, his songs have really soundtracked my whole life. And this is an artist whose music crosses generations, but it was really during my childhood that Michael Jackson became quite literally the most famous person and the most famous artist on the planet. And from a purely critical point of view, he remains one of the greatest pop artists of all time. He is multi-talented, or was multi-talented, in a way that we actually may never see again. A couple of months ago, Leaving Neverland screened on televisions all over the world. How many people have seen that documentary? Interesting, not as many as I thought. Well, if you haven't seen it, it was a four hour long an incredibly raw account by two men who alleged that they were sexually abused by Michael Jackson when they were young boys. Now, they weren't the first to make such claims, uh, but theirs came more than a decade after his death. And the issues around Jackson's right of reply have been fairly raised since. I mean, he's no longer here to defend these latest allegations. But I noticed, I guess most obviously in the conversations following the initial shock of that TV special, a more personal and subjective response to what we were seeing. We turned inward. We were searching for our own moral compass in our reactions. Do I stop playing Michael Jackson songs now? Is that what I'm supposed to do? 
What happens when his music comes on the speakers in a shop? What happens when the DJ drops Thriller at my friend's wedding reception? Some people actually told me that they didn't want to watch it. They knew what it could do to their own relationship and it would cause a crack in the bond that they shared with his work. It was an inconvenient truth. Art evokes emotion in all of us. It speaks to us, whether through song or screen or canvas. When we pull back the curtain on a creator's life and the view isn't so pretty, it can feel as though that connection is tainted, as though our own relationship with that is tainted. As Jason Green wrote on Pitchfork earlier this year, living with music in your mind from an abuser sometimes feels like being saddled with someone else's bad dreams. How do we make peace with these bad dreams once they have become our own? From a purely practical standpoint, and yes, I'm going to talk about cancellation culture, how do you cancel an artist like Michael Jackson? I mean, his creative influence spreads deep into the culture. He has shaped popular music for more than 50 years. And as Wesley Morris from the New York Times said, a fantastic critic, Jackson is a part of pop culture on a molecular level. And even if we do cancel him, what does that do for the conversation? Does it also silence the conversation and the discussion that we should be having? My field of study, as some of you probably know, and my passion, my career, revolves around music. But of course, this quandary extends into every creative field. And these questions have been asked for eons. This is not a new topic. But for the first time, the extent in which abuse and oppression has affected mostly women in every industry, that's being laid bare for the first time ever. And those responsible are finally being held accountable. Picasso, known misogynist, he regarded women as machines for suffering. He himself categorised his work under seven distinct styles, each tied to the seven relationships that he had with his muses. And two of those muses committed suicide on account of him. His granddaughter, Marina Picasso, said, that in, his memoir, said in her memoir that he would extract his muses' essence and once they were bled dry, he would just discard of them. Picasso hasn't been cancelled. His work is celebrated on gallery walls and in sculpture parks the world over. Is there an opportunity to revisit or recontextualise an artist's work within the context of the life that he actually led? Art's often spoken about as a cultural, emotional and sometimes mystical entity. As I said before, it's that magical something that you create from nothing. But it also very much lives in the commercial world. So when we hand over cash to experience art from creators with questionable histories, does that make us complicit? Do we buy that R. Kelly album? Do we get tickets to that Louis C.K. comedy stand-up show? Or do we head to the movies to see the latest Woody Allen film or get Roman Polanski's classics out on DVD? The pendulum has swung in the wake of the so-called Me Too movement. I hate that term, but it exists and we all know what it means because it's been around forever. More than ever, certain people are being called to account for their behaviour and more than ever, people are listening to victims. We're becoming more aware of the ways in this, which this behaviour has fostered too. We finally understand the grooming, the gaslighting, the complicity and the ubiquitous harassment in every industry. These are concepts that not everyone was wise to in the 50s and in the 80s, even 10 years ago. So what do we do with this information? Is it part of the artist's humanity? Or is it something that we can square away? Can we separate the art from the artist? In October last year, Constance Grady wrote a great piece for Vox Online, and its title was, What Do We Do When the Art We Love Was Created by a Monster? Heavy title. Her approach was very academic. She used theories of literary critics through the ages. There was new criticism, postmodernism, and the new historicist movement. And she pretty much used this with different academics to find her way through the thorny question of separating the art from the artist. Now, spoiler alert, she fell short of finding a definitive answer. However, one scholar made this point. Lecturer Claire Hayes Brady said that at the end of the day, a work of art is one that speaks to you and just to you. It's not a rational decision, what we love. It's not possible to have loved a text and then to retrospectively unlove it. So tonight, my challenge, 
to the rational thinkers in the room is to go one better. We're going to solve this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Good. Come on, guys. Are you ready? Okay, that's better. It's Thursday night. Our speakers for the affirmative. Professor Denise Ferris is the head of ANU School of Art and Design. She's lectured at ANU since 1987, and as well as teaching, Denise's works can be seen in major public collections at the National Gallery, the National Library, and the Australian War Memorial. Uh, Dr. Robert Wellington is a senior lecturer at the ANU Centre for Art and His Hard History and Theory. He's got a fascination with, Lou with Louis XIV and a special interest in the role of material culture in history making and cross-cultural exchange. And on the end we have Ray Mardia, lawyer, writer, leadership co coach and ANU alumna. And she can also recite most of the lyrics to Baby Got Back, which we may use at some point in the debate. For the negative, Dr. Kim Kunio is the head of ANU School of Music, has a passion for musicology, ethnomusicology, uh, and his work has been performed everywhere from music festivals to the White House. He's been commissioned by arts festivals and the Olympics alike, even collaborated with Antarctic Ice most recently, as he was telling me over dinner. Next to Kim, Dr. Monique Rooney is convener of the ANU Screen Studies Program and senior lecturer in English Literature. Dr. Rooney's research finds the kind of connections between the screen and other texts. And Dave, oh sorry, Monique is at the end. Dave, you guys swapped. <laughs> Dave in the middle is the director of, Dave Caffrey I should say, is the director of Art Not Apart Festival and Dionysus, and another ANU alumna. He's also the Minister for Party Affairs of the Australian Dance Party, not a political party, in case you were hoping to vote for them in a couple of weeks, and volunteers as the president of Music ACT. Let's hear what they have to say. Our first speaker for the affirmative, Professor Denise Ferris. Okay, welcome. All right. So can you ever truly separate art from the artist? And my question when I was asked to um, be here tonight was, well, you can, but should you? But let's le keep on the sort of affirmative side and let, let's not be too nuanced, which is what I also suggested the debate should be, and let's just sort of take a polarised binary position on this, which is probably not the answer, but let's just do it, just for fun. Okay. So... I'm going to show you some appropriately, it's called karma, pixelated works of great art, of art enjoyed by millions and millions of people for a very long time. And that's who the art was by, by a murderer, yeah, by someone who, uh, who has uh, got away with it, kind of but whose uh, chiaroscuro and whose artwork is incredibly famous. And most people would not know that about Caravaggio when we, when we look at his work, because most people would not look into the context of that in terms of their research. They would just simply consume, consume the art. Oh. Also, some paintings by a Frenchman. Artwork by Paul Gauguin, who was a wife beater, who had three brides in his paradise, um, all who uh, had syphilis because of his uh, actions, and uh, who died a very lonely man because actually in his time, in his time, people started to think he was actually very on the nose. So for people there, when he went back to Paris, he was actually um, disavowed, you could say, if you wanted to use art speak. And uh, he was seen as a sort of persona non grata. And that was his fate at the time, at the, at the time.
This work is evidently by a First Nations artist in Australia, a Torres Strait Islander artist, who's said to be the finest Torres Strait Islander artist ever to be publicly known in Australia. And with this work, who won the 29th Telstra Indigenous Award some years ago. His name is Dennis Nonna. He's currently in jail, serving time for a crime. Uh, and that's the context that actually allows his work not to be seen. So the work that you've seen here, you will never see in a public museum. You will never see in publication. You will not see it. So the work is lost to the nation because no one will show his work because of the background and the reputation and because of quite quite evidently, the, the heinous crimes that he actually committed. So that is the nuance of the judgments that we make. That is the nuance of the retrospective position that we take when we uh, don't know, but then we know, and then we act. It has a consequence, and I state that it has also a consequence for our nation in terms of our practice capital, our artistic capital, and what's owned by the nation. Now, I only knew about this yesterday, because I was um, judging an award with a curator from the National Gallery, and they said, oh, you know, so-and-so, oh, wow, he, like, had to retire from somewhere because he uh, dealt inappropriately with his students. So this is a photographer who did a, this series, which some of you may know. His wife is the woman in the white shirt here, and he did a series of the Brown Sisters across time. It's very famous, but he also made the most exceptional pictures of his family. He's a very fine photographer, and I was amazed, amazed. I knew nothing of this, that that colleague, who's a curator, could tell me that happened in 2018. And his name is Nicholas Nixon. And I, till that time, ha had revered his work. Do I still revere his work? Yes, I do. Can I separate Nicholas Nixon from the work? Yes, I can. Because my retrospective understanding doesn't actually change what Nic Nicholas Nixon has done. As an older man, He's dealt inappropriately, not, he's done stupid things, offensive things, suggestive things to his student, and he was asked to retire early. He hasn't done anything illegal, he hasn't uh, raped anyone or molested anyone, he's just been ridiculous and pathetic. But do I still revere his work? Yes, I do. and this person's already been mentioned, Guernica. One of the most powerful anti-war statements ever made, made by a man who has all the things that have been mentioned previously. And so how does that affect our perspective of Guernica? And for me, it's enough to know that he was dodgy, but it actually doesn't affect how I look at that art and the power of that art. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And now our first speaker for the negative team, Dr. Kim Cuneo. Give him a round of applause, make him feel welcome. Hey, thanks, Zan, and thanks, Denise. I mean, I must say, Denise, it, it is so disturbing to see these things and I think we have a serious side 
and I might partly look at it, but I might partly not as well, because I think we also need to have a little bit of fun. So to separate or to not, well, I wanted to start by thinking of the history of art and artists wanting to get their names out is a history we should acknowledge and really be triumphant about. Because in my field of music, we had music for a long, long time that no one got to put their name to. And I'm going to give you an example of it, okay? So... That's a short example of Gregorian chant, and, you know, we might chill out, we might think this is really beautiful. But really what happened is, for a thousand years in the early history of Christianity, no one could put their name on art. It was owned by the state. Let's think about what that means, right? You might have the impulse to make something, to try and make something better, to try and comment on the world, but someone actually says that what you do is subservient to what they want. And so on some level we have to argue that the artist has to exist to enable the canary in the coal mine, the people to say that there must be better, there must be greater. So we've seen what happens when it's wrong, but so often it is right, isn't it? And I just wanted to tell you a little story about how the, the way that we got music to be preserved was through this weird guy called Guido de Arezzo, and he's a bit like some of the people we've talked about. He wrote in around well, about the 1030s, uh, he said, well, I had to invent music notation because it took me so long beating the children to teach them Gregorian chant, I had to find a different way to enable music to be taught. So he invented do, re, mi, fa, sol, te, do. He invented the solfege, and he invented a stave with music on it. And so while this weird guy invented this thing, he enabled something amazing to happen, which was the composer came into being. And where those composers started, ladies and gentlemen, was actually at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. So I want us to think about that. So the rise of in music of the artist, of what we say can actually enable us as a culture to say individuals do exist, they have points of view, they can make this world a better place, was by two guys called Leonin and Pedatan, who are basically, they were, they're sort of like monk warriors in a sense because they basically wrote this music and they got together a professional music practice at the Cathedral of Notre Dame and it allowed all the music we have had since to exist. It's an amazing thought. I mean, I get really inspired to think about that. Then I'm going to cut a long time later to a guy who you've probably all heard of called Mozart. So, what was Mozart so good at? Well, he came into a world also where artists didn't get to, ex to exist, where the artist wasn't separated in a sense. Um, he had to make his living when he was young, both by teaching music and being this sort of performing you know, little kid. But then he did these things when he was young. He wrote what was called insert arias. Now, insert aria is the equivalent of writing uh, really bad jingle music today. And so he'd write it into the operas of other people who seemed to be famous at the time. But what happened? They became not famous. And Mozart's insert arias became some of the greatest moments of musical history, while the people he wrote for completely died. So we, we can actually say that Mozart has made the case for us as a person very, very strongly that we have to preserve the work of individual artists. And I'm going to play a little example if we're ready. We're going to listen to a little bit of a piece, not by Mozart, but a piece that he had a very important thing to do with. Let's press play. Can we go a bit louder? Otherwise, I'll have to sing it for you. <laughs> and there's a big boy soprano solo. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> Do people know this work? Allegra's Miserere Mate. Now, the Pope decided this work was so spiritually powerful that humans should only be able to hear this once a year. It was actually generally done twice in a year. And it was locked away under lock and key by the papal authorities. 
And Mozart, when he was 14, said, enough is enough. This piece of art is made by a person. It's part of our new secular society. He was getting, even as a kid, into these notions that we all have today of the enlightenment, of us actually craving for a libertarian equality society. And he said, I will actually get this piece out. So he smuggled in pen and paper, listened to it once, and wrote the whole thing out, 15 minutes of music, note for note. Isn't that audacious? That's what he did to enable art to survive with artists. So it's pretty amazing to think about that. And now I wanted to actually pick up my little guitar, if that's all right. Because I thought it's important, if we're talking about art, that we have a bit. Yeah, that would go. So I have a little song. And I thought, how could I really make our case? Because really... As we know, there is no case. The truth is that this is so nuanced and so scary. We have to think about everything to do with human nature. And we have to say that everyone, not just the great artists, all of us have a dark side. As the Dalai Lama said, basically, all of us suffer. The Four Noble Truths of the Buddha say, all of us suffer. And if we're not very careful, we make others suffer in response to that suffering. So here's a little song. I don't think I've ever played on one leg before. <laughs> so if I fall over, I hope it's okay. What about all this art, whoops, art stuff? Do you play the ball of the man? Especially when the bloke is a sleaze. You might not still be a fan. So tie me kangaroo down. Spot. Kangaroo down. me think about Rolf Mate and how he painted the Queen. He wouldn't listen to the wobble board without me losing me green. So tie me kangaroo down, spot. Tie me kangaroo down. Tie me kangaroo down, spot. Tie me kangaroo down. Me to Pablo Picasso, me to Harvey Weinstein. I'm in a rush to see Jeffrey. No, that will not be fine. So tie me kangaroo down, spot. Tie me kangaroo down. Tie me kangaroo down, spot. Tie me kangaroo down. And the moral to this little story is very easy to see. Separate the artist from the art, and Rolf Harris may be free. <laughs> <laughs> so before I go, I want to give you one more word. Gesumtumswerk, Wagner, total art, total creation. An amazing thought. This is a man who may, was able to design an opera house with the best acoustics that had been seen where you could get an orchestra of like 110 people to play underneath one soloist so you could get this incredible total art drama that Wagner wrote. And for example, one of his most famous arias goes, It's really big, right? But... What happened when you read about Wagner and anti-Semitism? What happened, ladies and gentlemen? Bye-bye. Is that you? Thank you, Kim. It's been a while since I heard Rolf Harris. Also, I'm a bit confused about what team Kim is on now. <laughs> so is he. Um, let's invite someone from the affirmative team to respond, Dr. Robert Wellington, Senior Lecturer for the Centre of Art, History and Theory. Please make him very welcome. Thank well, thank you, everybody. That's a, that's a, I'm very loud, so hopefully I won't have to bend down to this microphone. It's a very difficult act to follow, and I'm sure you're going to be very grateful, actually, that I won't be singing, if you've ever heard me sing. But my argument uh, tonight, and I hope you can see this down low here, is a very simple one. Not only can the work of art be separated from the artist, it in fact it usually is. Um, and this is especially true uh, if we take a longer historical view of the work of art. 
And as an art historian who's interested in long histories and deep histories of art and the, the things that art, artists have been inspired by over millennia uh, in many cultures, uh, I can't help but think about ancient Rome. 10 million tourists visit ancient Rome each year and around 4 million of those tourists will go to the Vatican. Now, we're not going to get into the politics of ethics of the Vatican tonight, but um, we will think a little bit about uh, the ethics of Roman society, a society that took great glee in the public slaughter of people, and yet a society that was able to produce works of such exquisite beauty uh, that we swoon in front of them when we go to see them, at least I do, and I try and make my students sometimes do. And I'm showing you here one work. Here's an idea. The Apollo Belvedere, dug up in Rome in the 16th century. This work here goes on to be one of the most inspirational works of art for artists uh, from the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century on. Do we know the name of the author? Do we know the name of the maker of this sculptor? sculpture? No. In fact, this is a sculpture produced in the first century AD by Roman craftsmen after a piece made by an ancient Greek maker. And we think it's only supposition that we know the name of this person. Anyone in the audience like to tell me the name of the person who made the first bronze version of this famous sculpture? No, not Donatello, indeed. It is uh, uh, Leo Charis. Anybody heard that name before? I hadn't either, and this is what I work on. Right? So either I'm a terrible historian or there's something to be said about the work of art being separated from the artist. I'm going to take you now. This was an opportunity for me to enthuse about one of the things I really love. Every time I'm very fortunate, I come from England, every time I go to London, I have to make a special visit to the Victoria and Albert Museum to see the artable carpet. And the artable carpet is, to me, one of the finest pieces of creation by human hands. It's a work of such exquisite beauty that I am happy to wait that 20 minutes until the little dark lights come on so I can look closely at the sum 300 to 350 knots per square inch that were tied together by artisans in 16th century Safavid Iran. Artisans whose like we have never seen since and will never see again. People who can make works of such stunning complexity uh, in veneration of culture that it doesn't matter where we come from or who we are, um, we gasp when we see them and when we, when we understand that these tiny, tiny pixel marks are the result of somebody tying a knot with their own hand. Think of the years this took to make. It's exquisite and it's breathtaking. But do we know who the maker was? No. Several makers, many makers. We've lost them to history. So, one proposition I would like to suggest as an art historian is that to say, to, to link the work of art solely to the maker, to the creative agent, is to misunderstand how culture works and to misunderstand how works of art really come to be. And I would say that the work of art is created not just by an individual, but through a complex and networked process of culture. An artist can only make a work of exquisite beauty or a work that touches us or a work that we come back to time and again throughout our lives. It can only make that work because the conditions were right for them to make that work. The individual person, the individual creator doesn't come from nothing. None of us come from nothing. We are part of a collective culture. And here is my little tree of collective culture. <laughs> do artists' intentions matter? Well, the first thing you learn as an art historian, and I do remember my rather grim and cross art history teachers telling me that no, we cannot reconstruct the intentions, particularly of a historical artist. And even if an artist does tell us of their intentions, of what they wanted to do when they were making a work of art, we can't really believe them, because perhaps they aren't the best witness to their own practice. They don't have the distance necessary, and they're not necessarily aware of their own, the, own, the sort of structures of, of cultural thought that they're born within. They, aren't, they don't have the distance to understand the complexity of their own culture. And here we have a, a lovely little cartoon for you that uh, makes, a, makes a bit of, pokes a bit of fun at why artists might make a work of art. Not for the lofty reasons that uh, uh, they might tell us in their gallery blurbs, but indeed uh, for other reasons. Reasons of recognition, of being someone in society uh, who holds a certain position and is acknowledged for being excellent in that way. 
So, I'm a little ahead of time, but I'd like to close by saying, if the question were tonight, should artists be held to the same moral standards as the rest of society? The answer would be clearly a big yes, and I put it in big, bold points so that you can see I agree with this idea that we should um, <laughs> check the morals of our artists. But it's not our question tonight. Our question tonight is can and should the work of art be separated from the artist? And the answer, as uh, my friend on the opposing team, Kim, has, has helped you to, helps us to show, is that in fact, we do regularly separate the work of art from the artist. Um, and that's how culture works. Thank you. It's very compelling. Thank you, uh, Robert. We next have, uh, in response on the negative team, Dave Caffrey, who is the producer of the uh, brilliant Art Not Apart Festival, among many, many other hats he wears. I believe he may have brought something along for us tonight as well. I'll let him explain. Dave, welcome. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Zan. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just get this right. Great. It's tough being an academic sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really intimidated by the situation. <laughs> but, but hey, it's fun, so we're going uh, to funk it up a bit. Uh, there is no doubt, of course, that an artwork should be able to stand by itself. We've got one here. It's standing up by itself. And without the author jumping into you, without the intention of what it should mean. Uh, meaning, of course, is heterogeneous, meaning changes and is dynamic. Perhaps that rug's meaning will change if we knew the, um, the background of the artist, and we don't. So the, that perhaps is not an appropriate uh, example when we are talking about cultural issues of today and whether or not we should be supporting idols and the, um, let's be honest, disgusting abuse that many of them have been doing in contemporary society at a time when we are trying to stamp that out. But there are many layers of meaning, and the artist comprises many, some of those layers of the artwork, not all of them. The artwork has many layers. Uh, you can choose to ignore them, but at great social cost. May I introduce to you Pudika, just over here. Uh, of course, the, uh, the affirmative side wouldn't want you to know what the artist's name is or any background, but I might give it to you anyway. Um, it's by an artist called Miss Clectic, who studied here at the ANU and it was recently commissioned by our arts festival. Um, the debate might dwell on the negative implications of attaching an artist to the work. Um, in the case of Chris Brown, of course, it should kill the work. Actually, you know what, I'm just gonna deal with the Chris Brown issue right now. Let's just go there, please. Um, obviously, Chris Brown's a dickhead. He talks about bitches as though they are, it's his right to hit women. He talks about putting them on the street. The real question is why do people wanna to listen to those lyrics in the first place? In my opinion, people are getting what they look for when they support idiots like that. Hitting Rihanna is simply walking the talk. No one should be listening to him. So now we got done with Chris Brown, because it's kind of a gross issue and he's a really freaking popular guy. And now Justin Bieber's trying to support him. No, no, no. He talks about it. He did it. We shouldn't support it. We shouldn't listen to it. Back to Pudica. Sorry, excuse me. Um, if we don't reference the artist in our appreciation of an artwork, it follows that we would also wouldn't reference the artist's statement and positive layers of meaning that the artist can bring to the work beyond its moment of creation. That moment of creation is very special, like an act of giving birth, and I agree it should be able to stand alone, but like the act of birth, parental guidance is recommended. In the case of Pudica, the artist has given an eloquent set of guidelines to its interpretation. Uh, the, the artist says, Technicolored plastic is combined with bone white gypsum to summon the symbiotic concepts of beauty and decay, life and death. Pudica takes the shape of both a reef and a female body, a mother which gives life. The iconography of multiple hands concealing the body refer to the classical art pose of Pudica, or shame plant, where women were depicted as covering themselves, which in turn drew the viewer's attention to the very thing they were concealing their sexuality, thus creating a notion of shame. Now, have more layers of meaning that I've just read from the artist statement helped you understand this work? Oh, I'm going to assume it has. Let's break it down a little bit further uh, because it's actually worth uh, considering this, this artwork, I hope, speaks to many of the layers in this conversation. 
Um, the artist, of course, lives in a time when the largest living organism on the planet is dying. The Great Barrier Reef is dying. And when women's incessant sexualization is finally being confronted at a global crisis, the artwork takes a second meaning. This work mixes the two, inverting the classical pose of puttika or shameful covering to draw attention to those areas, in this case, the, artist's, the artwork's suffocation, bleaching and critical erosion. But if you believe the author is dead and that the artist can be truly separated from the artwork, then please just forget all those layers of meaning that I've just talked about, for you wouldn't believe in reading the artist's statements. After all, you can't have an artist's statement without an artist. But there's a bigger issue at stake here, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed my learned colleagues haven't gone into the, um, uh, the essay, The Death of the Author, by, by Barth. The, of course, a, a postmodern take is the framework in which a lot of this conversation has, has, has arisen. Um, the idea that we can fragment the viewer's perception of a work from its maker. Um, in some ways, this would empower the viewer to create their own world of interpretation. But let's dig into that a little bit further. Um, Nietzsche, of course, was the godfather of postmodernism. In fact, Barth was relying on Nietzsche's idea of the Wilde Macht, which uh, we may know as interpreted as, or translated as the will to power. But let's, let's look at that a bit deeper. It's actually the best translation that I came across was the will to force a creation. So the idea that we can create our own phenomena, the, the, the world of interpretation that we have is something that we can empower ourselves. Uh, of course, Bart was pulling on that and said, no, if we want to, we can choose to uh, ignore the artist from this phenomenal or sublime or beautiful feeling that we're getting from art. Um, but it, that doesn't actually take into account Wilde Markt in its, in its entirety. So Wilde Markt would be to create a world beyond just the barriers that we discover. So this is the trick. When we discover that Chris Brown has hit Rhiannon or that Michael Jackson has fondled seven-year-olds or, you know, there's been a lot of examples, then you can choose to ignore it if you want to. Go ahead. But the problem that we're creating then is that we have all these idols. We have idolised and in contemporary society we are funding these artists. Do you want to create a society where, as the strict definition of postmodernism might support, that we can kind of ignore some of these inconvenient facts and that we can support an artwork or a world where we live? Or do we have a wider appreciation of the world that we're trying to create and under Zeville de Markt, more formally, we should be choosing to eradicate some of those problems in our society so we can actually create a world that we want to live in? Um, oh, I've got a little bit more time, that's great. So I'm just going to finish with a quick little um, question because I think that we've just got to ask it straight up. I mean, sometimes it gets a bit boring and academic, such as, you know, is the artist uh, a layer of significance to the artwork? Yeah, okay, we can talk about it. But ask differently. Will you dance to music by a pedophile? Or to demonise that, uh, to use that horrible term, a wife beater? And will you support their financial benefactors? The reason the question should be termed this way is because the artist, whether you like it or not, is a layer of meaning on any artwork. And your choice in today's society to either support or boycott a work is a vote about their acceptability in today's society and whether or not they should be paid. I know who I don't want to support or encourage the rewards in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And now our final speaker before we get our juicy rebuttals uh, is from our affirmative team. Ray Mardia is a lawyer, leadership coach, ANU alumna. Is she going to sing Baby Got Back? I'll let her decide. Please make her very welcome, Ray Mardia. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Um, if I just have one slide, so if we could... Um, so, good evening, by the way, and, and throughout my life, law, literature, and leadership all taught me to play with words, you know, to be, to try and be emotionally intelligent, and to make room for the views of others. 
I can talk about tonight's topic for hours, but in the next eight minutes, I'll ask you to do just that. You know, make room for the different facets of this issue. Um, I'm arguing for separating art from the artist, and the first word of tonight's question, can, frames it in terms of possibility. Are we able to separate? And I'll try to avoid words like should or must because prescribing everyone to feel about art actually feels like an Orwellian nightmare to me. You know, I've thrown away my Annie Hall DVD and you gotta do it too. You know, um, if you care about diversity of people and thought, um, this is a wonderful time to live that belief. And I'll quickly discuss five frameworks to show you how to separate art from the artist and to keep your hearts open while navigating this issue. Tonight's second word, you, is also important. You know, who am I speaking on behalf of tonight? Is it all of you in this room? Is it the world? Is it you the critic? You the artist? You the survivor? Um, the issue of representation in the Me Too era is delicate. And free speech principles say that you and I can respond differently to the same art because we're different people. And so do postmodern thinkers like Barthes who said that the artist is not only separate from the art, but they're dead. You know, you bring your pain, your values, your wounds and dreams to the art and I do the same. So I may separate, you may not. And realizing the subjectivity of this process allows us to make room for each other both sides of the table, and to separate art from the artist. The word separate is also really interesting, and I see this back and forth between the two teams. Um, the first is a critical separation. You know, is art less good if it's made by a felon or a rapist? Um, is art better if it's made by a saint? You know, and, and 20th century literary criticism uh, says no. The, and, and before that, it says that no, that the art stands on its own. Um, be it Degas, Wagner, Picasso, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and to modern artists like Woody Allen or Harvey Weinstein, many artists with fascist, sexist views created beloved works of art. Um, the belief here is that the book or song or film transcends the artist because it has the power to speak to humanity directly, like Denise showed beforehand. Um, the new historicist, did sort of shift gears a little bit and said, well, biographies don't make the art good or bad, but it adds meaning like Dave was talking about before. And so it encouraged us to see the art in all its complexity, you know, to know the artist, feel the discomfort, the awe, um, and to go to new grounds um, of that relationship between the art and the artist. So culturally, you'll see that there's precedent for both. And keeping that in mind, it's, you know, we can argue that it is possible to separate the art and the artist and to not as well. Um, the second kind of separation is a practical one, and I feel like this is where a lot of anxiety lies about tonight's topic. Um, Dave also mentioned this, and you might say, well, diversity is all great, but am I complicit if I separate a misogynist from their art and then continue to consume it? Those who say yes believe that the pain the artists cause cancels the joy or the appreciation that we feel for the art. And it's a zero-sum equation where your moral disgust has to become your aesthetic disgust. You know, and your attention and money then has to be turned away to support artists who are more virtuous. Right? But, but know this, the, the male gaze um, can be found in film, music, art, um, to not be complicit, we'd more or less have to stop consuming art overall. You know, every time I loved a Bond girl, admired a nude painting in a gallery, um, laughed at the Mean Girls montage, you know, or sung the Grease soundtrack, I may have been complicit in a story that I don't know. Um, art made by virtuous artists or women can still normalize the abuse of women because misogyny is in the bones of art and history and culture. So while boycotting art is one way to show survivors your support, there are others beyond this zero-sum equation. Um, this isn't about excusing the crime, but rather it's about being mindful about the complexities of this issue and to separate the threads and ask ourselves, what can I do for survivors? What can I do for the art? What can I do for the artist? What can I do for you? What can I do for myself? What does each of these people, parties, require of me. 
And so seeing beyond a zero-sum equation when offering support and solidarity is also another way to separate the art from the artist. Um, in my case, I work with survivors of sexual abuse and domestic violence as part of a lawyer and a coach. So letting justice fall and exposing the perp's reputation is just one outcome. You know, clients seek a range of outcomes, including apologies, undertakings, money, public attention, no attention, new opportunities, mental health support for them or the other party, or legal procedures, to name a few. Um, one of my survivor clients told me that Diane Keaton and her uh, costume designer, Ruth Hawley, made Annie Hall's legacy. And to say that it's a Woody Allen film diminishes Keaton and everybody else who worked on it. And so that really made me reassess and hear different survivor perspectives on this issue about separating the art from the artist. Um, plus, if, uh, from a legal perspective, if a person is guilty, the court draws a boundary and decides a proportionate response that balances the interests of the survivor with the perpetrator. Any study on recidivism will show you that if you take away someone's work, it increases their likelihood to reoffend. Now, that's not pity or an excuse on my part. Of course, we have to make the world safer for survivors, but the way or a useful way to do it is to ask them instead of assuming that what they want is my outrage alone. No, um, part of this issue is to also ask what to do with the artist's gift. By taking it from them, will the survivors heal? And will it rob them of what they want or the artists of their purpose and me of the art I love? And so it's important to keep testing these assumptions, which brings me to my last point. You know, one of the things I do as a coach is to look out for cognitive biases or distorted thinking. And seeing this question as either or is, is probably one. You know, it's probably both and. And what I mean by that is that an artist's art reflects something about them at a given point in time but people are complex and no one is one thing. Uh, Louis C.K. is funny and he masturbated in front of women. Kevin Spacey is facing five years in jail and he made some iconic movies. You know, uh, to borrow a Walt Whitman term, artists contain multitudes like you and I. And our brain likes labeling because uh, reconciling the light and darkness in anybody is a challenging workout for our hearts. But if we give each element its place, the crime, the art, the artist, <laughs> the survivor, the human, uh, maybe we can begin to work through each one and make true of these multitudes and contradictions that exist in the artists and in ourselves and each other. Thanks. It's like the Academy Awards, but less tuneful, isn't it? Um, let's have our final speaker for the negative team, that you cannot separate the art from the artist. Please make her very welcome, Dr Monique Rooney, Senior Lecturer in English Literature and Convener of the Screen Studies major for ANU College of the Arts and Social Science Sciences. Give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? I have three slides, so do I... O oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O oh, body swayed to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? William Butler Yeats's poem asks whether we can know the dancer apart from the dance, but also in the way that poet poetry can, it asks us to consider whether dance, in fact, gives us the dancer. Taking a very brief look back in history before returning to the present day, I insist that we cannot know the artist apart from the artwork. Sure, we can discern instances where artists have attempted separation. Ultimately, however, artists fail in this attempt in the face of public appetite to know the artist behind art. George Eliot is the masculine pseudonym of the female novelist who wrote the great 19th century novel Middlemarch, with the male authorship deterring readers from automatically making stereotyped assumptions about her fiction. 
Mary Ann Evans, the real life artist behind the pen name, also wished to keep certain aspects of her life private. Despite this wish to at least partly separate herself from her creative input, output, there are now in circulation print and screen biographies that detail the serious, the scandalous and the gossipy when recounting her life. The television biopic George Eliot, A Scandalous Life, was one product of our fascination with the author and the novel. There is, post-death, however, no living author available to correct the written record. As a result, the question of how artists connects to artwork, dancer to dance, becomes endlessly conjecturable, multiplying speculations about an artist-artwork ne nexus that can never truly be disentangled. Whoops. Uh-oh. Sorry. Hollywood, Hollywood star Greta Garbo is another famous woman who wanted to keep her private life just that, private. I want to be left alone is a sentence one of Garbo's on-screen characters uttered. The actor herself stated that she was able to express herself only through her roles, not in words, and that is why she tried to avoid talking to the press. Despite Garbo's own insistence on the inextricable link between actor and character, she struggled to keep actors hungry for news from her door. Hundreds of biographies, biopics, newspaper and magazine articles have, since her death in 1990, wanted to know the Garbo behind the image. Online speculation now joins these pursuits. A Google search of Garbo's name reveals she is the leading entry in one of the internet's top 20 reclusive celebrity lists. But do online and other searches ever find a Garbo separate from the screen artifact? The philosopher Roland Barthes once said that Garbo generated in viewers a kind of ecstasy. To look at Garbo's face, Barthes said, is to lose oneself in a mystical image that has the effect of a love potion on the viewer. Strong language. The desire to know Garbo continues. Based as it is on the hopeless hope that one can know a woman distinctly from the mysterious words and images that she left behind. Garbo is an excellent example of how we will relentlessly seek biographical information no matter how often the artist says she wants to be left alone. The stakes of such a situation have only increased in both scale and intensity in the context of our digital media sphere, where the possibility of separating artists from art is now well nigh, well nigh non-existent. Take international literary star Eleanor Ferrante, for example, who, like George Eliot before her, publishes her fiction under a pen name. The blockbuster success of her four-volume Neapolitan series has given birth to Ferrante truthers, who are fans that hunt for the real identity behind the pen name. It was jur journalist Claudio Gatti who tracked down a woman named Anita Raja, citing financial records and royalty payments as evidence for his discovery that Raja is the author behind the Ferrante pen name. The online world with its archives of personal records and immediately shareable data presents hazards for artists wanting separation from their art. And it is the living rather than just the dead who are vulnerable to intense scrutiny and exposure in our digital age. But surely death, that great leveller, remains the final boundary. Where other attempts fail, surely fi death finally separates the star from her curious fans, the author from his reader's insatiable appetite for personal news. In truth, however, fans normally know a star because of her screen presence or an author because of his fiction. Knowledge of the artist does not exist without the artwork, and death further cements and intensifies rather than severs the desire to know the art artist through artwork. Consider those celebrated artists whose early deaths generated further fame. 
The 27 Club is the name for a group of artists, including Janis Joplin, Robert Johnson, Jimi Hendrix, Amy Winehouse, who were either struck down or died by their own hand at age 27. Musician Kurt Cobain was one such artist. Cobain's suicide 25 years ago generated a veritable industry compi comprising biographies, biopics, and online debate, all of which have speculated about Cobain, and in particular, his motivations for his death. I hope you will forgive me for concluding my case for why we can never truly separate art from the artists by dwelling on this morbid topic, topic of death just a little bit longer. I turn finally to a, an example beautifully demonstrating the entanglements of the dancer with the dance. The impossibility of separating artists from art object. This performance followed the awful events in the Christchurch Mosque and One Nation Senator Fraser Anning's comments. While responding to reporters questioning him about those incendiary remarks, Anning was struck on the back of the head by an egg. The perpetrator, a 17-year-old teenager called William Connolly, shot to worldwide fame when live videos of the event went viral. Now known simply as Egg Boy, Connolly was within 24 hours labelled Hero of the Earth with an artist creating and distributing this image of him. The video of Egg Boy striking the senator is also a work of art. It shows the teenager, like a dancer, swooping in and then keeping his balance while live recording with his iPhone as Anning hits back at him. This performance art is, I propose to you, a moment of hope. It is a dance that cannot be separated from its Egg Boy dancer, the fame of whom is now interlinked via these two artworks with the former US president. Thank you. What a great angle to take it to and come at it from, the inextricable link of the artist and the art. That's what we're talking about. We've heard our arguments in full and now there's a chance for each of our teams to give a very short rebuttal now that we've heard each side. It's a two minute one, make it short and sharp. Are you ready, Denise? Hit it. All right, so now I can concentrate. I really thank my esteemed, my dearest esteemed colleague, Kim, because his argument is spot on. <laughs> Mate, art was owned by the state and in most respects, it still is. It's now owned by a state we call society. It's owned by our collective consciousness, our collective memory. As multiple parties actually own art, art that is made for public consumption, which is how we're defining art, um, you know, lots of people own it. It is, as Robert said, the work is a product of culture and shared consumption. We make that work. Shared belonging, collective memory, make the art that you and I consume and appreciate, and that's what it is. So the work is already shared, and that, as Robert said, is how culture, our culture, works. You are dancing to music, you are looking at images and those things are by unknown people. You might know who they are, you do not know what they are. Thank you. In response for the negative team, Kim Cuneo. I'll get Denise over lunch next week. But, but in the meantime, what did Denise say, actually? Well, there's been all this bad stuff. We have to get over it. You know, we could say it was a really amazing... I mean, I love the images, but that's what we got. Yes, people are bad, and, and we'll get over it. And then Rob sort of said, well, it's always been. You know, like, yeah, you know, I go off and I see it, and that's just, again, how it is. So th we have... 
this proposal like, do we accept the status quo? And then we get from Roe a really beautiful guidebook on how to make it work for us. But really, is that what we want? Don't we want to say no? I want to say no, actually. I want to say no to saying I really like Wagner when you get five minutes of good music in four hours of opera. I think it's a load of shit. <laughs> But the five minutes are incredible. But the thing is, you see, I'm Jewish. And I'm Jewish and I grew up and I used to actually serve the old guys who survived Auschwitz uh, food when they had backgammon. And when I talked to them about Wagner, they reviled. And the truth came out. And they had to revile when Barenboim actually said, I'm going to conduct Wagner because that's what a state does. But some people never, ever, ever recovered when Wagner was played. That's just the reality. And I think the truth will always rise. Yes, we can say for some period of time we can hold it back, but inevitably the stories, the people, the somehow come out. I mean, the great example for me is Aung San Suu Kyi. Let's think about her in the 1990s under house arrest. She was held up as the next Mandela. But then we, she actually always was anti the people she was anti. She wrote about it. She spoke about it. But then we wised up when the atrocity happened. Why didn't we wise up when it was happening? Because of the academic and intellectual laziness that society implores us to do. Let's just say this is art. When we forgive art, we forgive politicians, we forgive murderers, we forgive everything over time. What we have to say is time is up to stand up for what is good and not let it happen anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And now to respond for the affirmative team, Dr. Robert Wellington. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to my colleagues and to uh, the wonderful speakers on the panel against us. We've heard, actually, from the panel against us lots of arguments to support our case, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, Kim has pointed to uh, a terrible, contemptible man who invented musical notation. Imagine a world without musical notation. Imagine a world without Mozart. No, thank you. Um, Dave has spoken about the death of the author, one of the most powerful pieces of writing of the last 70 years, let's say, that tells us truly, in fact, from a Hegelian standpoint, that culture is collectively authored. Culture isn't something that an individual actor, an agent, can decide upon and can have agency over. Once you start talking about the individual agency of an artist, and particularly when that individual agency of the artist is uh, put to uh, a political purpose, we're in very, very dangerous territory. Um, and lastly, Monique has given us some wonderful examples of recuperative histories, histories of women uh, in literature and film uh, who we've learnt more about uh, after the fact and we've come to learn and enjoy. Now, recuperative history is part of a cultural movement of our time. The idea of recuperative history and feminist scholarship is located historically and socially in our time. And it's through this collective authorship and this collective culture that we've come to do things like rediscover um, wonderful women writers who had previously had to hide their identities. So I would like to end by uh, reaffirming my point, which is simply that we usually do separate the work of art from the artist. And in fact, um, I haven't really heard any arguments to the contrary. So thank you very much. <laughs> Boom. And in response, see if you can give that uh, to Robert, Dave Caffrey for the negative team in your rebuttal. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, it, look, let's get a bit practical here. Yes, it's fine to say that we're all collective authors and that the, uh, the world of art that we're going to keep creating is created by everybody but let's not encourage and justify pedophilia and domestic violence, please. I would like for us to be a collective author towards a positive future that does not support the problems that, at the moment, if we were to separate the author from the work, we would be celebrating that work and, as has been discussed, therefore celebrating layers of that work which are the artist and the values of the artist. We don't want to celebrate those values. Uh, but there, of course, the, the other side is we don't want to censure all of great art. I think the, the answer here is to 
to frown upon and remember that the artworks that we may reference, it's fine to reference them. It's not saying we should get rid of them completely, but we should remember that they are loaded with things that we do not want to continue into the future and therefore we should not socially justify them. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Oh. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and now our final speaker for the affirmative team. Please make a welcome in her rebuttal, Ray Mardia. Um, I want to thank everybody on both sides of the panel because this side of the table, uh, you know, certainly has a lot of overlap with some of the things we're discussing. Just appears that our interpretation is different, and this is really the heart of what tonight's topic is about. I agree with Dave that there are many layers of meaning when it comes to the artist, um, and the beauty of this conversation about separating the art and the artist. Um, belongs to all of us. And so the minute art becomes prescriptive, we enter into this space where art becomes political. It becomes a form of indoctrination where I tell you what you can and cannot do and how you must interact with the things that you love, the way that you feel about um, the people who inspire and Im impact you. Um, it's also uh, to, to argue that um, nowhere in our arguments have we condoned the crime or excused the crimes or created the aesthetic alibi, you know, the art excusing the crime. It's really to expand our consciousness about the complexities of this issue and to see that there are different threads and to have the awareness um, and the humility to make room for each other as we try and navigate all the different aspects of this of this topic. So um, I want to urge all of you to do that. I definitely have room for everything that my opponents have said tonight. And all I ask um, is for us to make room for each other as we move forward with this topic. Thank you. An olive branch from our final speaker. Let's see if uh, Monique can destroy that olive branch with her rebuttal. Our final rebuttal tonight, please make her very welcome. Destroy the microphone instead. <laughs> Thank you. So according to Robert, our team has supported their side. Um, however, our team st started with a song by Kim that we all immediately recognised as um, a play on a song by Rolf Harris. So immediately we got... Um, a song that cannot be separated from its singer. And we also had from Dave this Nietzschean idea about the will to power and the will to change, um, you know, some of the malicious things and some of the um, difficult abuse questions that are going on in our society and that it's possible to do that collectively. Um, the affirmative team did want to come back to the collective continuously. Um, Denise talked about a collective consciousness. Uh, Robert talked about uh, culture and culture is what makes art and um, there is no way of getting around that. And Ray talked about the law and different ways of addressing and negotiating what is a complex system that is built of a collective. But I'm here to remind you that culture, collective consciousness, the law, these things are made up of artefacts they're made up of artists, they're made up of singers, and they're made up of thinkers who are a singular. We don't have this collective unless we can come back to that singularity. And the point that I wanted to keep reminding you is that we can um, draw attention to people and to beings that are behind the art, but we can't separate the artist from the art. The artist is actually a word that refers to the art, just as the word dancer refers to the dance and singer refers to the, sing to the song. Um, so given, I'm a literary person, you might <laughs> guess, so given that entanglement of words, it's extremely difficult to ever, and I propose to you that it's impossible to separate the artist from the art. Thank you. Keep that applause going. Can we just thank all of our speakers tonight? Amazing arguments.
And now, before I add some final comments, it's time for you to decide. Have we solved it? Can you separate the art from the artist? I'm going to ask you to show me in just a moment by a way of applause, so make sure that you really know who you think's won, because I know that you've all figured it out by now. Um, and we'll decide the winner of this debate. Can you separate the art from the artist? The affirmative say yes. Who agrees with them? Can you not separate from the artist? Are they always inextricably linked? The negative, say, <laughs> who agrees with the negative team? Oh. I think the negative have it. One more round of the pause. I thought that the affirmative team argued their case incredibly well. Robert, I thought that your point on the artist's intentions and whether or not they actually matter was really pertinent. Um, I think that for, from your gaze, and we all come from this, from a very individual point of view, you know, we all uh, engage with culture in a different way. Robert, your engagement with culture is very much from hundreds of years ago. My engagement from culture, as you heard in my opening monologue, is very much in contemporary music. And I think that that idea of time is a huge factor. The things that happened a long time ago happened a long time ago. The things that happened three months ago are burned in our memory and we're reacting in a very different way. Uh, Denise, I, I was curious when you mentioned and showed the beautiful pictures from Gauguin and Caravaggio, did anybody know those stories? And are you going to look at those paintings differently the next time you go to the National Gallery? I wonder that, if that will change it. What of the voices that are silenced as well is a question that I have. And there are so many questions that sort of stem off of this conversation. It's very nuanced. For all of the people who abused their power, the often male artists who had a position of power and silenced the voices of women, of people of colour, of people who weren't as rich of them, what of those voices? Where are they in this conversation? Uh, there's a lot that I picked up on in this. I really loved how Ray said, basically, to quote a great, ta a great taco ad, why can't we have both? Um, because that's how I feel, we can have both. And to, to look at the full picture is not to be complicit in what that artist has done. It's impossible to unhear that song, to unread that book, and on an emotional level, it's impossible to unlove that artwork that you loved before you found out what that person had done in making it, or as a part of their life when they made it. The tentacles of this conversation do reach further. This, as I said, is part of a patchwork filled with grey areas, and I think it's something like all debates that we should keep questioning, keep talking about. Uh, and again, I think, as you've shown in these instances, it's very much a case-by-case -case basis. You can't just say, yep, you've got to separate the art from the art from the artist, or no, you can't. It's always different. Um, and this is a beginning of a set of questions that I hope that you take with you. You know, what does this mean for the artist? What does it mean for the victims? What does it mean for the culture that we've left behind, whether it's hundreds of years ago or two months ago? And what about, I think most importantly, the culture that we make in the future that we're all part of, the new history? Critical thinking on art has always been fluid. There's been a, a handful of philosophers and critical thinkers that have been referenced tonight. And I really think that each era celebrates and interrogates art in a different way. So in the context of kind of what this debate is framed around, this Me Too movement and this new era of thinking, maybe that can be part and add to the layers of what we already have. Plenty to think about. Thank you so much for being here. What an amazing turnout on a Thursday night. I mean, you could be drinking beers out there, but you're here, you're asking questions, and I hope that you got something out of this tonight. Please give another big round of applause for our two teams tonight and for yourselves. Thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you.